Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to this special event tonight with Douglas Trumbull and Michael Benson, where we'll be seeing and discussing some newly discovered storyboard drawings for 2001, A Space Odyssey, uh, that are in Museum of the Moving Images collection. Um, I'm Barbara Miller. I'm Director of Curatorial Affairs at Museum of the Moving Image. And um, this event is part of an ongoing series of events related to our exhibition, Envisioning 2001, Stanley Kubrick's Space Odyssey, that's currently on view in our gallery, which of course is closed. Um, that exhibition was originally organized by the Deutsches Film Museum in Frankfurt, Germany, and draws on material largely from the Kubrick archive at the University of Arts London. We look forward to welcoming you to MOMI in person when we open back up. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll continue to bring you events like the one this evening, along with um, a lot of other great content um, to see what we're up to. Please just um, head over to movingimage.us. And as you know, this event is free, but we sincerely hope that you'll make a donation to the museum in whatever amount you are able to. So we could continue to bring you events like this one, as well as have the support that we need um, to get our doors back open when we are on the other side of this lockdown. Um, as the event um, unfolds tonight, please feel free to use the Q&A feature on your screen to pose questions. Um, we will try and get to a handful of them towards the end of the discussion. Um, before I bring on our special guests, I will introduce them briefly. Um, Michael Benson is a writer, artist, and filmmaker whose book, Space Odyssey, Stanley Kubrick, Arthur C. Clarke, and the Making of a Masterpiece, examines the production of 2001 and was published on the 50th anniversary of the film's release. Douglas Trumbull is a film director, special effects supervisor, and inventor. He contributed to, or was responsible for, the special photographic effects in 2001, A Space Odyssey, um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Star Trek, The Motion Picture, Blade Runner, The Tree of Life, among others, and directed the movies, Silent Running and Brainstorm. Let me um, bring both Michael and Doug back into this, uh, this meeting. Hi, Doug. Hi. How are you? I'm good. Um, let's see if we can get Michael back up on here too. Good, we're all together. Hello. Well, welcome and thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, Doug, I see you, um, you're there on the, on the discovery, in the discovery centrifuge, <laughs> right. um, where, where you live um, all the time. No, um, <laughs> it's really great. I'm sure everyone, and the audience is enjoying um, seeing you in that in that environment. Well, watch what you say because Hal's right over there. <laughs> um, so, in tonight's conversation, we're going to focus on a couple of things. We're like um, like as advertised, we're going to be sharing these newly discovered storyboards that uh, Doug, you and I came across. We're going to put those storyboards in the context of how they were made um, by Graphic Films in the summer of 1965, and we'll talk a bit about that. And then we'll also talk about the scene that um, that, that storyboard depicts, and the scene is from an early version of the screenplay, and we'll get um, kind of very deep into the weeds um, about, about that scene and how it evolved over the course of the development of the film, of, of the screenplay, and then ultimately how it was portrayed in the film. So let's set this up a little bit first. Um, let's talk a little, Doug, just briefly before we show the, the drawings about where they, who, who made them, where, where they were made, and how, how they got to Museum of the Moving Image. And I, I can, I can I can contribute a little bit to that, but um, why don't you why don't you set us up and tell us, um, you know, how, who 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 was working on them in the summer okay. of 1965 in LA? Okay, well, I was uh, a young artist, illustrator, uh, background artist, animator, and I had grown up on science fiction, so my portfolio was filled with spaceships and alien planets, which got me my job at Graphic Films. And Graphic was a company specializing in space films for NASA and the Air Force. And it was kind of semi-photorealistic simulations of things, including working on the entire Apollo program to make movies for 
I think they were shown to Congress to raise money for the whole thing. But we got a job for the New York World's Fair that was going to open in 1964. So this was back in 63 uh, to do this film called To the Moon and Beyond, which was shot in this unusual process called Cinerama 360, which was a 70 millimeter film projected on a giant dome screen over your head like a planetarium show but it was a story. It was narrated by Rod Serling. It was about 10 or 12 minutes long. And it depicted space and the universe and the microcosm and the, and the universe and black holes and the Big Bang and a lot of stuff like that. Stanley Kubrick and Arthur Clarke saw that film at the fair and immediately called Graphic Films and said, did you guys make this movie? And they got Les Novros, who was the owner of the company. And he said, yes, yeah, sure. And so by some other means that I'm not, I wasn't privy to these phone calls, but uh, they made a deal for graphic films to start doing some pre-production design on 2001 mm -hmm. at a very early phase before it was even called 2001. The earlier script was called Journey Beyond the Stars. That was the script that I first saw. So I was doing illustrations of lunar landers and moon bases and stuff like that. Someone else, and I don't know to this day who it was, did these storyboards that you now have. Mm -hmm. It's not in a drawing style that I'm entirely familiar with, although it includes things like this pod, a very early pod, a one-man space capsule that a person could live inside of mm -hmm. and had manipulator arms on it that could grab things. And it was based on an early pod designed for NASA. It right. was done by a guy named Gordon Legg, L-E-G-G, who was one of my bosses at Graphic. So you can tell from, if you have that drawing, you can tell there's a kind of a similar design, but not exactly the same drawing style. Yeah, and we'll, we'll actually show the, those sketches in a minute. We'll see them in the storyboard and then we'll show the sketches. And, and here I'll just jump in and, um, and say kind of why, how, how they came to be um, in, in, in the museum's collection. So the museum um, received a, a large donation from the family of Lester Novros in 2006 that included a lot of material right. that graphic films, that, that the pre-production material that graphic films made for 2001. And they were the, a lot of original sketches, some of which were made by you, Doug, um, yep. and, and a host of other folks there, um, and correspondence between some between Lester Novros and Stanley Kubrick, but largely between Con, Con Pedersen and Stanley Kubrick. And, and eventually, of course, Doug, you and Con both left graphic films to work directly with Kubrick on the film. But in that summer, we, we have all of this material that Graphic Films um, made for, um, right. for, for the film. And to kind of bring us up to speed, up to the moment with these storyboard drawings, um, you know, when the material came to, into the collection at the museum in 2006, um, the, I, I was not there at the time, but, but whoever was there before, before um, went through this, this kind of voluminous archive that, that we received, which included a lot of other material that Lester and his company had, had generated. Um, and pulled out a lot of the, the material that related to 2001 and set it aside. And we've exhibited that in, in various times and it's in our, it, some of it is in our exhibition in Vision in 2001 that's up in, at the museum at the moment. Um, but there was a lot more material and you had asked at, at one point when we were preparing for the exhibition, Doug, you said, well, let me just come by and see what else is in Lester's archive. I'm just curious to see what's in there. So you and I went through some of those boxes and in doing so, we opened up um, an unmarked envelope that just looked like it was part of research for a book that Lester was putting together about yeah. the history of motion pictures. And in that envelope were these storyboard drawings that no one had ever seen before. And at first we, we, we didn't really know what to make of them because what, you know, what, what were these? Because um, really what, what Graphic film was, Films was charged to do was really just create these um, moonscape con concept drawings and act as uh, scientific uh, advisors, but ultimately they wound up playing a, a, a much greater role. So um, we'll talk, we can talk a little bit more about graphic films in a minute, but, but before we show the sequence of drawings, Michael, can you set us up uh, in terms of where we were at, at wh where, where the screenplay was, how, they, how Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick were imagining um, 
Frank Tool and his sort of EVA and um, fixing the outside of the discovery, like where, where, where were they in terms of imagining that scene and, and that narrative? at that point in the summer of 1965? Well, it's interesting. I mean, the summer of 65 was such an um, intense period of, of rapid shifts to the story. Like, it was almost every day, you know. And of course, during the production, as Doug will be able to say very, you know, clearly, they were also changing scenarios day by day, hour by hour. Um, it's interesting that um, among the information streams going into Stanley Kubrick, you know, he had his own, uh, he had his version of the, the HAL console with multiple screens and multiple data streams coming in at him. And one thing I found when I researched my book was uh, the letter written by Elliot Noyes Design Bureau at IBM. Um, and I should note parenthetically that Arthur Clarke and Stanley Kubrick didn't mess around. They went to the top they went to the best people in the business. They went to Marvin Minsky at MIT, uh, the co-founder of the art of the you know, artificial intelligence lab at MIT, and a you know significant figure in the history of AI research. They went to I. B. Good, the who had worked in the Bletchley Park circle, uh, breaking code during the Second World War. You know, uh, and um, they went to IBM, and IBM became a partner, a collaborator in 2001. Anyway, so in July 65, that same summer, Elliot Noyes Bureau sent a package of material which included a scenario, uh, a drawing of an astronaut floating in a brain room of a computer. And Roger Karras, who was uh, working with uh, Stanley at the time, you know, wrote a cover note saying, well, they're asking you to consider the idea that a computer of the complexity and the, the sophistication of the one we're talking about for discovery would be a computer that you don't walk around, but which you can go inside of. And, and um, Kubrick was in a, I think, uncharacteristically defeatist mood when he received that. He probably was exhausted. Um, and he wrote a letter back, which was an entertaining read for me, uh, you know, many decades later, where he said, you know, that, that this is a totally useless thing. It's irrelevant to our needs. It's a total fuck up. <laughs> it's wasting our time. And let's move on to the next thing immediately. And then he signed it something like irritated and exasperated, but lovingly Stanley <laughs> to Karras. And then he did think about it clearly. I mean, and then, yeah. and then he and Clark, as they continued uh, cooking, you know, this thing, yeah. realized that, oh my God, you know, that could be very useful dramatically to have a brain room. Um, so that's one thing I could say in, ex you know, in response. But then I have other sources of information about, you know, I've looked at script drafts from that summer where you don't have this coherence between, the computer was then called Athena. In script drafts in the summer of 65, uh, the computer was Athena, and the computer was not a, a, a character yet, really. The, the computer was more of a tool. Right. Um, you know, and, and so, but then Hal was gradually evolving from, from Athena. The re one reason that Hal, uh, that Athena changed to Hal is Athena was an IBM product, and as, as Athena got more and more irrational and, in the end, homicidal, <laughs> homicidal um, an astronaut killer, it uh, became clear that they had to take the IBM logo off, you know, um, and then Hal appeared because Marvin Minsky, and I'll shut up in a minute because I want to hear what Doug has to say about all this, <laughs> but Marvin Minsky, um, you know, suggested that this, a computer in the year 2001 could wor work heuristically and algorithmically, both heuristically and algorithmically, two different ways of approaching the problem of, of artificial intelligence. And it's not clear to me to this day whether or not he specifically suggested HAL as the acronym, but it was heuristic algorithmic. And that became HAL, which replaced Athena and became more of a complex character. Yeah, I mean, HAL, I mean, um, Arthur C. Clarke would swear that that's accurate. He was constantly fending off this whole thing that IBM is one letter away from HAL. Yeah. And so there was a constant barrage yeah. of stuff about that, which he was 
constantly discrediting. It's just, yeah. it's, it's, it's just hard to imagine the, 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 the coincidence. I, I think in your book, uh, Michael, you say the, the coincidence of that is, is vanishingly small. The odds of that are vanishingly small. Well, what I said is it may be subliminal. And I would point out that um, Arthur himself uh, wrote that, you know, they came up with the name Bowman for their lead character. They had been thinking the Odyssey. They'd been, they'd been mining the Odyssey. They came up with the name Bowman and it took Clark and Kubrick six months to recognize that the name they had come up with is a description of uh, Odysseus, you know, who at the end of the Odyssey shoots his bow through those axe handles, you know, wins his wife back, kills all the suitors and all that. And he was the bowman, Odysseus. So, so that was subliminal. And I think that, you know, he's, and Clark himself said it was probably subliminal. I can't believe it was a coincidence. And it's pro there's probably some of that in this Hal thing, but I do know for a fact that Minsky said heuristic algorithmic. That's yeah. the two ways, you know. So let's uh, let's yeah. watch this storyboard. Yeah, we'll we'll see how this this unfolds. Okay. You have to put parentheses around accident. Well, in the in the script, actually, and we have the script pages. We might maybe we'll share after this. It, that is the title of the scene. Yeah. So, so essentially, um, Graphic Films had a copy of the script, and they were working on how to visualize this scene where Poole goes out to fix something and then has this accident that renders the discovery unable to communicate with Earth and also Maroon's pool outside the Discovery. So they were advising, Graphic Films, Con Pedersen specifically, was advising Kubrick on the science. And also what to me is sort of amazing about this is um, not just advising on the science, but working towards visualizing the narrative, that is the, to me, that's the big amazing reveal about this, that it wasn't just, here's some concept art from the science perspective, right? They were working for NASA, they were, but, but they were filmmakers. Every, everyone there, Doug, as you know, were filmmakers. So they weren't going to just, you know, limit themselves to drawing what a spaceship would look like. They were coming to this work as as filmmakers, as reading yes. reading the screenplay, and um, making their suggestions of how it would would play out. So it would be great to hear from from both of you um, how you know wh where um, you know where the production was and the pre production was in terms of the the conception of the the narrative um, how it would how things would be depicted the role of dialogue all of that as distinct from how it originally uh, how it um, in, you know in, inevitably wound up on the screen. Well, one of the things I would say about it is that as as a filmmaker myself, the the storyboard is a very classic cinematic language series of shots. You know, they would have to come at you very fast. I don't know what the total stack is there, but there's probably 40 or 50 40, shots. Yeah, 40, 40? shots, yeah. yeah. And so this was what transformed during the production of the film from conventional cinematic language into a first person point of view language that Kubrick was starting to develop. He was starting to abandon inserts, over the shoulder shots, reaction shots, and all the normal trappings of the cinematic language. And so this would represent probably a couple things. One was uh, precocious young filmmakers, you know, wanting to have their effect on this movie by doing the storyboard for the great Stanley Kubrick and Stanley Kubrick saying, ah, I don't want that at all. I'm not going to go that direction at all. And so you'll see that the, this sequence in the movie is totally, utterly different. There's certainly no antenna and, and the other stuff that happened in this sequence. Um, transformed totally in the making of the film to where the issue about the antenna is it's almost insignificant, insignificant except that it is the means by which they communicate with Earth. It's the beginning of the threat to HAL. 
it's the beginning of people on the ground in, at Earth saying, well, you know, we've got a computer here that can take over for Hal for a while uh, and run the ship remotely. Mm -hmm. And that was probably the first inklings of a threat that Hal was going to get taken out of the loop. Um, and I think that's a long story that we probably don't have time for tonight. But uh, Can I just say that um, uh, this storyboard does follow fairly closely a script draft from the summer of 65. Yeah, so yeah, like, it would be great to hear you set that up, Michael, and we'll watch yeah. it again. Um, you, sort of you, do have, you do have a script uh, from the summer of 65, and I, you know, I was looking at, our, I had the privilege of looking at Arthur's own script, you know, because I went to look at his papers at the Smithsonian. And you do have um, a scene uh, where, the, where Poole goes out to fix micrometeorite holes, and he's patching holes in the side of Discovery. Uh, and, and, and then the thruster on the, on the pod um, right. inexplicably fires and gets jammed. And, you know, when I read that in the script, I thought, this is a, this is a script writer saying that there's a problem. Why is it inexplicable? You have to explain it, you know. Right. So then they eventually got to that, you know. Um, and so what uh, graphic films did is they switched it from patching, from putting you know, kind of patching the bike tire. <laughs> you know, they made it look more sophisticated with these wafers we're seeing, electronic components. And, and I think, Barbara, you have a letter from Khan to, to Kubrick in which he says, we've changed this yeah. and we did it for these reasons. Um, and we think it should be like this. You know, but I would note that even though, Doug, you I'm said gonna, this- I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring that up just because it'll be fun to see it. Well, I keep, okay, great. Keep, yeah, keep talking and all. Doug, I would say that even though you said it's completely different, there are elements in there that are showing a bridge to the two, 2001 we know, including those, you know, that um, electronic components that have to be retrieved from the antenna base, you know, rather than the antenna being smashed by the pod, Right. breaking communications with earth it was more some component so yeah there uh, there in that letter you can see he's saying um with respect to the accident we've made some alter alterations from the first plan um we're not patching punctures and this is a routine but not common event we're you know replacing decayed performance electronic components so so the a5 unit or whatever the a535 what is the acronym? AE35. the a35 unit is it, you know is is um, prefaced or you know uh, forecast by Khan's note there? I would say mm -hmm. um, you can see the evolution of the thing in in yeah. that note. Um, yeah. um, I think, and, and also really just to 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 um, to, to emphasize the. Um, just the, the 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 sense of participation that 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 there was the the the, the almost a sense of partnership mm. in in not just helping Kubrick um, have the tools to create something that was scientifically accurate, but contributing to to the narrative, saying no, it wouldn't be this, it would be this instead, and here's a good suggestion for how for how this would play out. Yeah, there was a kind of a distillation that went on, I think, with, with Kubrick in the, the style of the making of the film, which has to do with the production design very intimately, mm. and then the, the extremely wide fisheye lenses that could tell a whole story in one shot. And so you can see sh sh shots in the storyboard inside. He's in the pod. He's got his hand eye control. He's banging on something. He's look. You, you've got an over shoulder shot of him working the two controls. All that's actually in the movie but with a completely different design, not anticipating that you could be inside the pod with a fisheye lens, looking mm -hmm. down over, over his head, over Bowman's head as he's driving the pod or over whoever's in there, um, with all the readouts going on. And the readouts are telling you things at the same time, and the controls are all in, it's all in one shot. Yes. And yeah. it was the use of extremely wide fisheye lenses that enabled all kinds of stuff like that to be told very quickly including uh, the fact that right on the front of the pod is a Hal's eye. Yes. And so there's no question but that the pod, which is coming at the camera in that shot, is going to kill him. You don't see him kill him, but you can see that it's Hal driving the pod. It's very clear from the director's point of view that, that he's telegraphed that to you in those shots. 
By the way, that shot, that particular shot with the pod coming at the camera with Hal in the center and their jump cuts. Yeah. Um, that one, that seems to be a, a reference to uh, Frankenstein where the monster comes at its maker. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think that was probably self-consciously there for that reason. Um, can I tell you that I, I, when I was digging around uh, on my on my book, you know, research in my book, but then for this conversation, I did find a communication between Clark and Kubrick in October 65. So right after that summer, when they were trying to figure out how to handle this, synthesize these dramatic elements. And were, and were, were you in, um, in London by then, Doug? By the fall of, of 65? Yes. Yes. October? Yes, definitely. Yeah. I was there on the, on the job, yeah. Yeah, so I think Clark was probably not in London or he would have just said that to, to Stanley. He was luckily, luckily for a researcher into this film, he was always all over the place. He was, you know, in the States, he was in Sri Lanka. We have the correspondence. Yeah, we have the correspondence. But he wrote and he said, um, if we wish we can make the accident, and they called it the accident, uh, an in integral part of our theme, not just an episode inserted for excitement. After all, our story is a quest for the truth Athena's actions show what happens when the truth is concealed. Um, so he's he's basically saying, let's fuse these things. You know, Athena's yeah. actions and the accident. Let's let's pull those together um, without even quite realizing it himself. That's what he's saying, I think. Right. Um, um, and also from that same month, <laughs> um, uh, uh, there there is a notebook that survives, which is at the Kubrick Archive in London, and it's in Stanley Kubrick's hand. Um, and it's a set of notes about the film and it's dated October 65 and under the heading killing the computer Which obviously immediately follows our accident and the killing of the crew um, Kubrick arrived at a, a Really important moment of insight, you know, and it's just in his in his hand and, and a note to himself computer tries to talk Bowman out of erasing incapacitating incapacitating it slowly becomes more and more and that's it but that's the whole scene right there with the deprogramming the next you know that epic scene with the deprogramming by bowman of the of the computer he hit it yeah. he hit it in a note to himself it's really it's hard to um it's just hard to imagine that the story of the film was not originally conceived with Hal as a central character. I mean, that's what's really startling to see yeah. to see something. You know, the you know Kubrick and Clark started working together in 1964. So by July 1965, like, there was a lot going on. Yeah. Harry Lange and Fred Ordway were were working. Um, they were you know poised to start you know shooting in in a, in a matter of months. So this wasn't this wasn't the very this wasn't sort of very early on. This was already things had been established. There was a lot of work had, had gone into the film. And yet this, this central idea of this artificial intelligence that becomes the antagonist of the, of the film, it's just hard to imagine how not being in that film. And yet they really only got to the centrality of that character and the characteristics of it, almost as a narrative device. To solve, yeah. to solve but, you know, problems. I would just say that at that exact period of, of that summer of 65, you know, that incredibly um, creative period, um, both Clark and Kubrick and, you know, uh, their collaborators, you know, Ordway and so on, were interfacing with IBM, with these people I mentioned, and researching, 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 and getting up to speed on what the latest forecast was as of 64 about computer intelligence. You know, um, I found fascinating letters, you know, from Ordway to IBM um, saying, okay, well, do you think the computer that we're currently thinking of, you know, currently planning on having an IBM logo on could get a little bit irrational? Uh, could that computer perhaps start making mistakes, you know, and it's all kind of diplomatically worded. Um, and then there's a second, that was in August 65, from Ordway to, uh, to the IBM executive, Eugene Rorden. Um, and then by October, so August, September, October, three months later, um, 
he's already writing and saying, well, guess what? This computer is getting a little bit more crazy and we are going to, I mean, I'm paraphrasing obviously, um, but, and we're going to take IBM's logo off because we obviously cannot have your logo on a computer that's, you know, going to be doing these things. So, so you, that's, that's the cusp, right? Yeah. Between August, October 65, they're, they're getting, they're getting to, um, they're getting to Hal's, um, Centrality and um, and and misbehavior. Let's let's be generous. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, but so if that was obvious that that couldn't have been true early on when IBM signed on. Right. Yeah. But I would note, by the way, that IBM logos are 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 on those iPad-like devices. IBM logos are are throughout the film. It's just not on Hal. Um, and one other point I'd make about Hal's evolution. So back in six, in June 64, that's as close as I can date it. I'm circumstantially dating this um, uh, undated chapter draft for the, for the novel that Clark wrote in the summer of 64. And, and in, at that period, a year ahead of what we've been talking about, um, Hal is actually a robot. Hal is called Socrates. So you had Socrates as a robot and, and there, there's a bridge between Isaac Asimov and Forbidden Planet and yeah. 1950s sci-fi, you, know, yeah. yeah. um, you know, the iRobot stories of, of Asimov, Clark's buddy, and, and he admired Asimov immensely, um, you know, and the, the, main, the gleaming, shining mainframe that stands up today as, as an AI, you know. And there's an interesting description from that chapter draft that, that, that Socrates is roughly the size of a man and walks on legs comprised of intricate assemblies of sliding shock absorbers, universal joints, and tensioning springs. And, <laughs> and, and Socrates is no more intelligent than a bright monkey, which I found fascinating because, you know, you have the man apes at the beginning, uh, but also when switched to independent mode, this this robot that's no more intelligent than a bright monkey can transform into an autonomous individual in this chapter. So you can imagine the dramatic possibilities there of a robot that's no more intelligent than a bright monkey allowed to be autonomous within discovery. <laughs> yeah, but that was the, that was the, you know, the, the predecessor, the, you know, the earliest version of Hal was a, was a robot. Yeah. Yeah. Doug, it would be great to, um, to just elaborate, for us to elaborate just briefly on, um, to talk a little bit more about graphic films and your, your experience there. And, and while we do, um, I'm just going to show a couple of sketches um, just to give everyone a sense of the, the kind of main work that was going on at, at graphic um, and how, I mean, you know, if, you're, if you remember what the um, pod looked like in those storyboard drawings, it was very close to what, what we're seeing uh, on the screen. So this is, this is the way um, the artists at Graphic Films um, were thinking about how, what, the, what the design of the pod would be like. Um, Doug, can you, I'll show, I'll show a couple of these drawings, um, a couple of, some of this material from, from Graphic Films, but can you say a little something about what it was like to be working there? Did you have a, a sense of, like a, a full sense of what, um, what you were being brought in to, to work on? Did you have a sense of the scope of it? And um, you know, what, what, what your role was in, in, in some of this conception? Well, I think it's fair to say I was a very young man, 23 years old when I was there. I think these drawings of the pod were by Gordon Legg, not me. There, you've got some other ones that are by me. But um, the minute this project showed up, and as a young man being familiar with uh, Kubrick's films prior to this, I was blown away that I was going to actually interact with this person or work on his movie. I just thought this was the greatest thing that could possibly ever happen to me in my lifetime which turned out to be very true <laughs> and, and I'm, 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 I'm forever grateful for it. So it was an, it was just an, a, a buzz the entire time I was working on that movie. I was, I was on the movie two and a half years in London or in Elstree and every day was special. Every day was unique. Every day was a surprise. And some of the biggest things that happened for me was that, I discovered myself and Kubrick 
discovered himself as a filmmaker, and we found out that we were very much in tune. And so I became increasingly important to him. I started out as an animator. I was doing Hal's readouts. But the fact that uh, they came out okay and that we built a special machine to build readouts, mm. he tried me. He said, well, I'm going to – I can just – I'm paraphrasing too. I'm going to step dog up and see what else. And so a model came in, which was the moon bus, which was a fiberglass model that looked horrible. And he said, well, what can you do to make this look better? And so I was taking my airbrushing skills as an artist, and I painted the outside of the moon bus and came up with the idea of gluing little pieces of model kits on there. And that created a style for all the miniatures for mm. the movie. And so then he said, well, Doug, why don't you shoot the moon bus on the stage? I said, what? Really? <laughs> a camera on a set? You're, killing, you're kidding me. But I did that, and it came out great. And so it was one thing after another, after another, after another, which led to the Stargate and the Jupiter machine and all kinds of stuff that I was scaled up for by the time. I was working under this master filmmaker. And going back to one of my thoughts about seeing those pod drawings is that, for example, the pod showed a, a guy inside of a pod with a plexiglass dome on the top of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. That would be extremely difficult to photograph because you would have to have a live action traveling mat if the camera could see through the dome to what's beyond the actor in the background. And so there was a style that was established kind of directed by Kubrick and probably also by Jeffrey Unsworth and also probably by Wally Beavers who was in charge of the physical effects to figure out how to get camera angles that needed very few special effects. Mm -hmm. I think, it, you so, know, I was, I was thinking about that earlier too, how, um, in, in those storyboards, for example, you know, uh, Poole is inside the pod and he's operating the arms remotely, but in the film, of course, he's outside of, of the pod and, and he's, he's doing that repair in space, that there's also, um, the stakes are higher. I mean, it, you're so vulnerable. You're just <clears throat> sort of floating around in the most sort of vulnerable human state that you can possibly be in and that there, there's also a power to that a, a, aside from the difficulty of, of shooting that scene of someone inside a pod and, and the action that followed there's also just the, the visceral sense of being, mm. being outside floating in space and being so vulnerable yeah. and of course to be yeah uh, but I, I guess I'm executed. just I think that's correct I, I just saying that there is very cleverly done changes that were made in the production design to yes. make the shots easier to do because first of all when you're inside the pod, you can see out, but from outside the pod, you can never see in. Mm -hmm. And you'll remember another shot where he establishes that when, when Kier does his spacewalk earlier on, when Bowman does his spacewalk to take the AE-35 unit out, he pushes a button on his arm and his face mask yeah. goes dark. It's like a polarization trick. Yeah. Therefore, you don't need to see anybody in any other spacesuit, and you can put a, a stuntman in there instead and get away with it. Right. You yeah, and by the way, uh, I would shout out to Bill Weston, who was a, such a hero. I mean, the oh, stuff yeah. who did these um, I extraordinary uh, live action stunts, you know, hanging on a, on a thin cable. Doug, I think you have some pictures. Do you want to show us some oh, of those? Yeah. Way above I a hard like concrete I'll, I'll floor. I'll see if I can find it for you. With Kubrick having no mercy about things like, you know, oxygen for the poor man, <laughs> things like that, you know. Um, small, small details. Can you yeah, see so, those, I mean, those? Those EVAs were a major. Um, the, the, uh, it was a major contribution by Whip Bill West, and what he did in that film was a absolute. There he is. Can you can you see that? Do no, I need I, to put? No, you need to. You need to share oh, it with us. Oh, how do I push the sharing on? Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, there's there's. There is, a, hold on. Here we go. There we go. It's a green button. Look at this. So there's Bill. Can you see, see Bill? That. Nope. You've got to you know, yeah, there we oh, go. there we go. That, there's Bill. <laughs> there, there's Bill looking really exhausted because he's been uh, had oxygen deprivation very much as a as the man he was playing did <laughs> while dangling on a cable up there. Well, what I was told about that those scenes you know, was the the upside down uh, zero gravity stuff was shot with him hanging toward the camera and the camera is underneath looking yes. up. And so he's covering his own wires. Right, very dangerous for everybody. No way to get rid of it. Very dangerous. For, if he fell, he could be seriously hurt or killed. And the cameraman and the camera would be destroyed and all that kind of stuff would happen. Well, well, it, but 
the, the, the most interesting part of the story is that he had a little oxygen bottle that actually added oxygen inside of his helmet. And there was they, no, they, yeah. somebody said, well, what do I do when it, when it runs out of oxygen? He said, well, just when I, when I go limp, let, lower me down. He would go all the way to total oxygen starvation. Yeah, and by the way, there was no way to remove the, the carbon dioxide. There, you know, he had oxygen coming in, but the carbon yeah. dioxide built up in that yeah, suit. Right. And when he went to when he went to Stanley, that's Bill going to Stanley, said, I would like to cut some holes in the back of the helmet and we can put some some kind of screen there so that no light comes through so I can breathe, Stanley. And Stanley said, No, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, there he is again. Um, but I was told that he was actually not a professional stuntman. He was a mercenary soldier. He had been a mercenary soldier, but he had done stunts. Then he went on to be a stuntman. Um, he had done a number of uh, Bond films before. He had done Bond films and other work before 2001. Yeah, okay. Yeah. There, yes. was, that great, there was that great still that you showed us earlier, Doug, of, um, of the, I guess, their, the pot is upside down and also... Here it is. Upside down. Coming hey, can up. I say, since, since our focus is really, wow, I mean, so there, there he is way above. There was no safety net below, and he was right above the camera. So uh, there was an incident, by the way, when he came out of the pod, and um, the little control, the control handle, which was from a de Havilland vampire fighter plane, literally bolted on the front of that spacesuit, heavy, a heavy thing, fell off uh, the front of his spacesuit and and hit the assistant cameraman oh, wow. on the head, and and you know luckily glancingly and he had to be taken off to the hospital and be stitched up. But um, that's how dangerous it was. Wow, that shoot. Um, but you know another thing I wanted to say since we are referring back to those storyboards and there's some storyboards behind Stanley. Oh, that's great um, that they're behind him right there. Yeah, so that's, that's the later pod. Scene. So that's obviously in London. That's probably in, in, that's in the UK and after the graphic films drawings that we saw. Oh early. yeah, way, way after. Yeah. Way after, way after, yeah. Um, but what I was gonna say is, um, uh, you know, um, in, in those earlier script drafts, there was no EVA, it was really pool Actually, there were several iterations of it. In one, he just stayed in the pod, and then the pod went out of control, and Poole it was right. lost, lost to history because he couldn't get back. Okay, but then later on, there was an EVA to fix, you know, to patch things and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that all evolved. Um, and you can see in, in the, some of the earlier pictures, in that earlier picture, that film frame, you can see that the air hose separated out. And I would note that, yep. That was kind of added as an Achilles heel of sorts because the moon suits didn't have this kind of ridiculously vulnerable piece of why, you know, of, of hose going from the oxygen tank to the helmet. Why would right. you make something so vulnerable? Well, you would do that because you want Hal to be able to assassinate the astronaut. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, can I say one more thing about the graphic films uh, storyboards, which is that the quality of them is really harks back to 1950s science fiction in the same way that we were talking earlier about, you know, um, Robbie the robot and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you see the bridge between what graphics films was doing for graphic films was doing for NASA, which is making films that were useful to, to intrigue Congress people to fund NASA. And, you know, and then this bridge to 2001 A Space Odyssey where everything got much more sophisticated. Well, also, I think what, what's interesting there to, to think about is that in the films that Graphic Films created for NASA and the Jet Propulsion Lab, et cetera, there, were, there weren't any people. <laughs> yeah. there, it was, they were spaceships floating around in space. So the focus was on creating these, these environments and shooting these models. I yes. Think, um, I think it was probably fairly new to them as a company to try and depict what dialogue looked like or what, um, what character, how characters would interact on screen. Exactly. Yeah. Doug, I have to say that, you know, some of this stuff you're throwing up on the screen is just extraordinary. I mean, this particular little model with, this, with the shuttle and the, and the EVA and everything, that's, that's something I hadn't seen until you showed it just now. Well, you yeah. got to come to my little secret archive. <laughs> <laughs> See you next Thursday.
<laughs> uh, which is like you, see, you, you can see off to the left on that on that particular photograph a kind of a grid like thing in the upper left corner behind the yes yeah. well that was probably a remnant of an early idea that went away early on of these radiators to right. get rid of uh, excess heat from the nuclear reactor right right you know another thing i would say though about graphic films and that bridge between the 50s and 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 the future as presented by Doug and, and the other wizards who made 2001 um, is that Con Pedersen had worked with Werner von Braun when he was still in the army. And then he also worked with, with, with Con Pedersen being, you know, uh, the graphic, graphic films employee who wrote that letter to Stanley that we saw earlier. And not only did he work with von Braun when they were, when he was in the army in, in the 1950s, but then he worked on the Walt Disney Company's TV shows from 1955 to 57, um, which, were, which really created the vocabulary, or, yeah. or I should say brought the vocabulary, the technological vocabulary of 2001, meaning wheel-shaped space stations and streamlined space shuttles. And that whole vocabulary of space flight that Werner von Braun promoted with Walt Disney in the late 50s, um, you know, ended up being refined and made utterly believable in 2001. And Con Pedersen was there during, you know, working on those Walt Disney. Right, right. I, that was, those were seminal for me. I watched every one of those shows as a kid. Oh, was that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and those shows plus Collier's Magazine were instrumental in persuading the American public that space flight was not some ridiculous science fiction fantasy, but it was actually something that could be accomplished, could really and be. It was, and it was that vein that Kubrick was tapping. Yeah. As, a, as opposed to the, to the sort of fantasist trajectory and that kind of tradition. He, he was tapping into, the, into that, almost like a popular science vein that was, but was very, very well informed. It wasn't green um, little men with yeah. giant heads. It was, it was real science that was being deployed to gain the support for space travel. So it was, it was not just Kubrick having some arcane knowledge that this, that this tradition existed elsewhere. It was very much in the public domain, but it, 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 it had not really penetrated the storytelling traditions that were that Hollywood was exploiting. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, hey, Doug, um, would you mind, um, before we talk about what you just have on the screen, do you mind going back to that wireframe so I can say uh, a, a word and then, may, then, then I'll shut happy, up? Happy, so, happy to do so. Hold on. Okay. So I find this extraordinary that, that, so, you know, in visual effects, and correct me where I'm wrong here, but in computer graphics and so on, you have something called a wireframe which is a, you know, a simulation of a three-dimensional object you know, in what looks like wires, but is never, was never specifically made in wires. But, but what you're showing us, Doug, and then you should talk about it, you know, uh, which I find extraordinary, is you built the antenna that's at the center of the accident. Um, out, of out of wire. <laughs> out of wires. <laughs> and shot it with high contrast film and made what looks like a computer graphic out of it before there were computer graphics, right? Yeah, just trying to find the other shot. Here, here we are. This is building it at my desk. Building the wire frame. Build, <laughs> you know, with a little soldering iron and some wire, and there it is. Building the future. Incredible, yeah. Yeah, so there was, there was just a kind of a, uh, a, a process of what to me and what to Kubrick seemed obvious things to do that I could get approved with a, a, a blink with Kubrick because we trusted each other. And I'd say, I can just build this out of wireframe and I'll shoot it with my Nikon and I'll do it in animation with different frames and we'll shoot it on, on the animation stand. And he would say, fine, go do it. Next. We had, we had one question uh, come in from a participant that, was, um, that wanted to know from you, Doug, whether there were any effects that were devised or that, that you had a hand in devising that didn't make it into the final cut that you, uh, that you wished had been visible. Well, that's actually a tricky question because I can't remember exactly uh, what was in the final cut of the film versus what was in the early version because there were 17 minutes of shots, many of which I did, that didn't make the final cut uh, that after Kubrick, you know, excised them. 
and one of them was the AE35. I don't, is it? Oh, let's go back to that. Yeah. That, that Michael, of the x ray shot of it? Sorry? You remember the, was the, in the final version of the released movie, is there the x ray shot of the yes. AE35? It's yes. in there. Okay. Oh, yeah. Because that was one of my favorite shots. No, it's that, fantastic. That was my fun yeah. little idea. So I built a rig to mount that device, which was a, this one, this is a, 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 a uh, what do you call it? A gyro stabilizer for an aircraft. Mm -hmm. So that is what the prop was. And we painted it a little bit and tricked it out. And then I put it on a piece of plywood with disc that could rotate. And I took it to an x-ray place that did medical x-rays. And I said, well, just shoot 150 different angles of this thing on this rig that I have built for you at an angle. And then we took the x-rays and put them on the animation stand and photographed them. And that created a really cool little readout. So it's just yeah, endless, endless stories like that. <laughs> Maybe I could find you something about it here. Uh, can you see this that I've got on my screen right now? Uh, we just see. I see black space. I see a black. A, yeah. It'll no. It'll start in a second. I hope. That's not starting. Uh oh. Ah. So that's how I photographed it in my office. That's my drawing table on the right. And that's the antenna against, you know, in front of black velvet with some lights. And I shot it with my Nikon and got this and then animated it from a lot of different angles. So there's... Oh, that's great. Ah, uh, that sound. The sequence. And, and by the way, that's, uh, that is Stanley Kubrick's breath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which I found Un out. Uncredited. Oh, yeah, uncredited. Um, that's him breathing. Um, ah, great. So this there's the AE35. That's a rehearsal with the AE35. You can see up I here. See. I can't get my cursor on this photo right when it's up here. But, uh, you can see the wires behind him. Yep. And then there's Bill doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's the shooting of the scene over the shoulder of the probing the AE-35. Ah, and there's your x-ray. No, this is not the x-ray. No, is that's another, your wireframe. I made a wireframe of the AE-35 as well. Huh. Well, I hope I'm not confused in saying that the x-ray is in. Well, I'll, I'll look at it again. So this is just this little sequence. It's cut very short, just to show you the nature of and that's like. that's such an extraordinary um yeah this was a really amazing stunt that built in. this was this is probably the most risky shot in the movie yeah except for except for cure delays coming into the into the pod bay yeah exactly so um we have a, a couple of other questions yep um let's see well first of all yeah. um just want to say hello to dan richter who's out there oh dan. hi dan hi dan hey man <laughs> So, I don't know if you heard the question, um, is it likely that Marvin Minsky made suggestions about what Hal's voice should be like? And then I want to actually tack on my own question to that, which is something I've always wondered about, um, about the, when, when, the, when the computer transitioned from Athena, which was a, which was a female computer, and event, eventually became Hal, um, Hal is obviously voiced by a male, and I, I wonder if there was ever a conversation about the gender of the computer and what, why a male voice was thought for that, and whether it was intentional that that it should be male or it was decided it shouldn't be female for some reason. So just, I, I guess, just the to, to sort of talk about the decisions around what that voice should be. And it, eventually it was uh, the voice of Douglas Rain, who uh, Kubrick knew from, the, from narrating the National Film Board of Canada's um, great documentary right. film, Universe. Right. Um, right. But what, what went into the decisions? Because I, I, I did read some of the correspondence about that, where, where Kubrick was articulating the kind of sound that he wanted, kind of not too threatening, kind right. of friendly, but very- Unctuous, unctuous. 
exactly. But 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 why why male and what what would it have meant if Hal's voice was female? How would that have changed things? I just wonder about that. Well, the early story that I heard when it was still Athena was that uh, female voices were being used in flight simulators and heads up and displays and alerts in cockpits of planes because pilots, male pilots would respond to a female's voice. Even if it was a pre-recorded, you know, put your flaps down, put your flaps down, put your flaps down. They would pay attention. That was the story I heard from Khan, you know, early on. Then I know there, I, I, I'd heard, my, Michael, you could probably confirm this, was that Kubrick was thinking of using, using Marty Balsam's voice. He did. You, he recorded him. He did record him. Yes, yes, yes. There were multiple different voices tried. Um, to answer the questioner, um, not that I have firm knowledge of this, but I'm absolutely sure that Minsky would have been consulted on will computers be able to have voice communication? And he would have said, almost certainly. You yeah. know. And lo and behold, we had Siri within a few years of 2001, the year of 2001. Well, even during production, we were hearing computer generated voices. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. That, well, I, but you know, Arthur Clark, that's another aspect of, of how. Um, Arthur Clark had visited IBM. Uh, no, it was the GE. Um, what was that brain trust in GE? What was it called? Um, he, he visited GE and they played him the first, the, 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 a recording of the first uh, computer uh, song, computer generated song, com the, among the first computer generated music pieces ever yeah. which was which was a, um, a synthetic voice singing daisy yeah uh, and then he came back to stanley and said my god you got to listen to this and played it for him and and then that ended up you know with a different voice you know in fact with douglas rain's voice um singing that um so we have the history of computing entering the film in that way yeah. um um and, and then, you know, he, he tried various different um, types of uh, voice and even, I should say, even Douglas Rain's voice, and I describe this in my book, was processed in a very sophisticated way, slowed down without the key changing. And there was a specific device, analog device, um, used at that time to slow, slow his voice down yeah. without, the, the, without changing the key. So if you hear Douglas Rain in the uni in universe, that National Film Board film, uh, he doesn't sound like Hal, actually. He sounds, he's a little sped up from Hal because he was, that was his normal speed. Um, okay. Yeah. I don't know if that answers the, the question. Well, there was a really interesting discovery somewhere along the line of a weird kind of a tape recorder that Kubrick found, and it had a spinning playhead. That's it. That's and the device. so it created a little microscopically small Doppler effect with the interface of the magnetic field on the tape and the magnetic head passing by, so you could change the pitch without changing the tempo and vice versa. And vice versa, and that's what they used. Yeah. That's in my book. I, I stumbled on that kind of late in, uh, in writing my book. And, um, that, and that probably gave the effect of something slightly synthetic to the, to the voice. Well, yeah, Kubrick didn't like, he heard a lot of synthetic computer voices from the day mm -hmm. that talked like, you know, horrible versions of what Siri is now, but. Yeah. Um, with you know very mechanical sounding things and kind of weird hello how are you or no even worse than that nice. but yeah he hated all that stuff you're he really thought, good thought at that, that was really corny that was great you might have missed your calling there <laughs> <laughs> yeah sure um one thing i would say though about that doppler effect this machine i forget the exact name of it it's not a 35 unit um but you know, when Hal slows down at the end, when he is in his terminal deceleration of his brain functions at the end and he's singing and, you know, um, that was using that machine. So the, the, the pitch didn't yeah. change, but the speed changed. And so that, that kind of um, little ma sonic magic was the result of that machine. Yeah, I thought it was quite beautiful. Yeah. yeah. It was very beautiful. Yeah. Very powerful. When I, you know, when I first fought, saw the film, I was six years old. In 68, my mom took me to see it. And that scene of the deprogramming of Hal was what haunted me and stayed with me, you know, forever after. Because it's so, it's so fundamentally human. I mean, the, yes. the, the um, if, if, if that scene had 
taken place, even even with how dramatic it was with 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 Bowman in the space and the and the, and the taking out of of, of all of the the components, sort of hearing hearing something die yeah. in that way yeah. and um, pleading pleading to be to not die. Yeah. Um, right. Somehow, you know, and also somehow you were a million miles from Earth and not even close to Jupiter yet. When you know somehow that was achieved that you, you know, you really felt like you were there way out in space. Yeah. Well, one of the other little stories behind Hal's brain and the death of Hal, which I think is a beautiful little story is that Kubrick had a really profoundly intense sense for mechanisms and technology. And he was determined that every time one of those little slabs of memory would come out, it would come out perfectly smoothly. Mm -hmm. Everyone was on an individual motor and an individual switch, because I'm sure some grip said, "Well, Stanley, just let me know, and I'll shove it out for you." Yeah, no. But uh, no, no, it's got to go. It's that inexorable kind of slow pacing that pervades the whole movie. That's really just quite stunningly beautiful of itself. Well, you know, since Dan is listening, and hi again, Dan. Um, hi again, Dan. Dan Richter, who played, for those who are not initiated, played Moonwatcher, the, the, the man ape that had the idea of using a bone as a weapon. Um, speaking of all those little switches, um, my understanding from researching it is that when they built the Dawn of Man set, you know, using front projection, large format um, transparencies, to project Africa on the back behind yeah. and then with right. the set in the front, the only way they could get the uniform light effect of the way sky lights things in a uniform way. I mean, you have a key light, let's say like the sun is rising. So you have a major, you know, have a light coming from the side, but then you have this overall glow. The only way to achieve that was with some incredible number of bulbs and each was on a different, each was on a dimmer. So it was thousands of bulbs. Um, and once again, there was the, the, you know, you hear the voice of the grip saying, well, Stanley, that's insane. We can't possibly have that many bulbs on dimmers. I mean, there, how could, nobody's ever done that. Well, so you're going to do that now, you know? <laughs> yeah, that was Stanley. They, own, yeah. they each had their own switch, every bulb. That's, that's hey, Dan, that's we can see Dan now. now. It was a whole patch field of switches, and each bulb had a switch. Yeah, and not just a switch, a dimmer, right? Yeah, or, yes. I, well, I don't remember that specific. Okay, I might have gotten that wrong. Maybe they just turned some of those many, many, many bulbs off to, to, for the effect were, of dimming. Michael, there were so many bulbs. I, you know, <laughs> we're talking hundreds of bulbs, and that he could just by oh, take off this one, this one, this one, this one, he could just, just suddenly adjust the, the light in all, all over the whole uh, stage. Yeah, and part of the problem was, for example, when you had your leopard that was about to jump off and, and go hunting to, for one Dan Rick, younger Dan Richter, um, <laughs> it was on a kind of a, it was on a cliff that was reaching towards that sky and you couldn't have it being too bright or it would destroy the illusion entirely because you know the top of a mountain isn't brighter because it's closer to the sun, right? Yeah. So that's how they got around that. Yeah, and the, the there was so the, there was so much light there. There were there were brutes. There were you know twenty k's, ten k's, arrays of lights. The temperature was well over a hundred degrees. Yeah. In in, the, in those suits, in those suits. And we were wearing, plus we were wearing the suits. And there were people <laughs> standing on the side with compressed air and oxygen and things like that, just waiting for Stanley to shout, cut. And they'd run in and try to revive us. <laughs> yeah. Just trying to, trying to keep everyone alive till the, till, till the yeah, end of the- We didn't lose anybody. We lost a tape here, but no people. I mean, that was, uh, that's the other, you know, Dan, I don't know if you were listening earlier, but I was trying to, you know, stumblingly trying to describe Bill Weston's uh, experience dangling from that wire. You saw him doing that, but he, you know, Stanley would refuse to allow him to punch air holes in the back of his mask. And he had, he had a little bottle of oxygen. So you guys, when you and your fellow uh, Australopithecus, I guess, uh, came along. Yeah. yeah, Australopithecines, excuse me. Yeah. Um, it was a similar situation, right? You're bottled up in, 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 in a costume and, and you're, it's, a, it's 100 degrees and you couldn't really breathe. 
very well, right? No, we couldn't. That's why you occasionally you'll see photographs of us off stage with tubes in our masks. Uh, you know, getting re we were ready to go on. Once we came off, they had to come off. They, uh, but our guys actually went on strike. They said they just wouldn't do it, and uh, we had, we it took us a couple of days to settle it all, and they had to get quadruple pay and. We had to have medical personnel and the compressed air and all of that. Yeah, it makes sense. Yep. So I guess we can, um, we should probably start to, to wrap up. Um, maybe we'll actually, we'll take it out with, um, with just showing, showing this one more time as we say our goodbyes. And, um, and also really just kind of emphasizing um, how much there still is to learn uh, about this film. I mean, that, that was, you know, so, so many things stand out to me in, in having st stumbled on this material, the, 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 some of the new light that it sheds on what we already knew and that there's seemingly an, an, endless, an endless amount of things to, to discuss about, about this seminal film. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, you know, I could quote something if we have another minute. Sure. Okay, so I was looking through Arthur Clarke's Lost Worlds of 2001 and specifically looking for this, the accident. And, um, and I found a passage, uh, you know, written um, uh, as a preface to some prose treatments that he wrote in 64 and 65, you know, in preparation for the script. And in that preface, which it was published in 1972, Clarke commented, what caused us the most excruciating problems were the accident in mid-voyage and the exact nature of Hal's insubordination. We knew that faulty communication would be the heart of the trouble. And then there's a nice parenthesis, as of most troubles, close parenthesis, <laughs> and wanted therefore to break the radio link with Earth in such a manner that it could not easily be repaired. Okay, so that sets it up, right? They had so many um, it's pretty interesting that you found this, you know, very fortuitously found these storyboards because it feeds into that whole dilemma of how to do it, you know, how to set it up. Yeah. Yeah, really, really this pivotal moment where, where things turn from, from, from one to the next, kind of setting, setting up how the rest of the film would unfold. Yes. So, um, so we, w we, will, we will gather again. We will gather, we will gather in person. Oh, let's hope. <laughs> on, the, on, the other, on the other side of this, whether whether it's 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 sooner or later, um, we 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 will be there again, and um, and I'm 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 very hopeful that we'll be able to um, extend the exhibition um, past mid July, so that when when we do open, people will be able to come and see it, and there there will be more events um, um, along the lines of this one, where we will all be able to gather gather in the theater and uh, watch 2001 A Space Odyssey in 70 millimeter on our, on our big screen. Yeah, fantastic. So, yeah. so thank, you, thank you both so much for doing this. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to, to speak with you um, about this, and I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, thank you so much. I just thank want to thank you, Dar Darren Docterman, my friend who made this. This is a computer generated version of the centrifuge. It's, it's not a fantastic. photograph. Oh, you mean you're not actually in the centrifuge? I'm not really there, but <laughs> you're de you know. destroying destroying my dreams. They will, this is a computer-generated image of, of all my books too. <laughs> it's, it's too much of a hassle to actually unpack them every time I move somewhere, or or, or to read them. Yeah, okay. it's a privilege to be on the same program, Barbara, as you and Doug, as you. You and too, Dan, Michael. Dan and, and Dan Richter. And Dan Richter. Yeah, Dan. Goodbye, guys. Bye. Thanks, Dan. Take care. That was fun. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks.